Welcome to Beer Wine Spirits. Today we're out here at Boston's Bistro in their wonderful beer garden, bringing you the last installment in our Ohio Beer Conference series. Tonight's show is going to focus on Jim Cook, the man behind Sam Adams. We're going to go and watch him do a presentation uh, that he presented to the conference. Not only is it very interesting for beer people, but it's a fascinating lecture on uh, what it means to be in business. So stay tuned for more Beer, Wine, Spirits and uh, a great segment with Jim Cook.
of Sam Adams, I think, uh, other than Andrew Steam and, and Fritz Maytag, you know, uh, he was very fortunate. You know, my grandfather was a brewmaster and never made much money. I, Fritz's grandfather invented the washing machine. That was a good, you know, a really good idea. Father is <laughs> <laughs> here today, um, who started this whole thing, and Fritz was fortunate to have a trust fund so that. Uh, as he once told me, Jim, if you want to make a large fortune in the beer, if you want to make a large, if you want to make a small fortune in the beer business, start with a large fortune. I know. Uh, so he lost a lot of money on it. It wasn't really a role model. And uh, this, in 1984, um, I think Red Hook was the largest microbrewery. There were 2,300 barrels. Sierra was the opportunity to look like in 1984. And I quit my job uh, as a management consultant to start Sam Adams with a business plan that said, in five years, we will grow to be 5,000 barrels. That was like a huge number back then. Uh, that was twice the size of anybody else uh, at, at that point. Um, and we will be eight employees, we will be a million dollars in revenue. And that's, that was my goal when I started Sam Adams. But I Beer. And it was also uh, the first year to be aged in bourbon barrels. 
that wasn't always legal. That uh, that is uh, that the phenomenon of aging beer in these spirit barrels is only 20 years old. Um, it's actually something I can tell somebody the story sometime about how we got the BATF to approve it. Um, but you're thinking about mixing different tax classes of alcohol is the kind of thing that they freak out about. But you know we do it every day now. Um, so that kind of spirit of innovation um, continues to motivate me uh, to get up every day and to do new cool things. And we just uh, now have uh, nitro being <coughs> in cans. And it took us three years to figure out how to fill those freaking cans because uh, it's no it, it's no easy feat. Uh, you know, getting the oxygen out, getting the nitrogen in, getting it into exact exact balance so that you fill. Uh, that nitrogenator at the bottom of the can, that widget thing, and get enough pressure in there to keep the can rigid, and have, uh, but have little enough that it doesn't gush out when you open it. These things are fun things. It's fun doing, you know, white ales on nitrogen. We did a hundred IBU IPA on nitrogen. It drinks like 50. It's really cool. Nitrogen. I mean, to me, this is a like a big white space in beer. We all assume that beer, you know, has carbonation unless it's a stout and then it comes out of a Guinness faucet. Well, you can use that same uh, set of uh, flavor techniques with lots of other beers. Uh, it, if you take carbonation out of beer, you take the carbonic acid out, you take the tongue sting, you take a big piece of the mouth feel uh, and the acidity, and it turns out that uh, about half of the bitterness we get from hops is actually uh, from the carbonation. Um, we'll, we'll have it on shelves in a couple of weeks and, and uh, try Canada, but it's a 100 IBU nitro IPA that drinks like 50. And so it completely shifts the hop profile. So I guess my point is that there are tons of really great wonderful beers that have not yet been created. You know, we got to remember that, you know, porters and stouts and pale ales and all these great foundational styles of craft brewing, they didn't exist when God made rocks and dirt and trees. <laughs> Human beings created them out of their own passion and imagination. There are many more great beers to be created out of our collective passion and imagination. So uh, let's set to work making some of those. power of a good idea. Um, you know, we started with not much. I started Boston Beer Company with $240,000 that I raised from friends and family. That's kind of about 
uh, part of the course today. Um, the whole company was two people. It was me and a woman named Rhonda, an extraordinary person. Uh, and as I look out in this room, it still bothers me that uh, it's as heavily uh, male as it is, because one of the things that I'll talk about later, when you talk about talent comes in all packages, one of the things I've learned is um, when you're looking for talent, when you're looking for you know energetic, passionate, creative, resourceful, intelligent people, God made about half of them as women, as near as I can tell, at least uh, that I believe she did. Uh, <laughs> there'll be more of them here, I think, in 10 years, because uh, we all have daughters and want every opportunity uh, to be open to them. So uh, what I've learned is these two people, me and Rhonda, helped create the whole industry here in the United States and a movement which is now transforming how beer is made all over the world. As you all know, craft beer is teaching the Germans how to make beer, and the English how to make beer, and the Australians, and not just great brewing countries, but craft breweries are springing up all over the world, in Chile, in Mexico, and I actually learned uh, how you say brewmaster in Spanish. Brewmaster. <laughs> That's it. It's like, you know, how do you say sommelier in French? <laughs> uh, so we've uh, taught the rest of the world that uh, beer doesn't need to come from huge industrial, global, intergalactic brewing conglomerates. It can come everywhere in the world from the drive and the energy of people who just plain love beer. Uh, the fifth thing I put up there, which is a more business uh, principle, but it served us very, very well. Um, and that is, it's a crazy average. And, and what I mean by that is, um, we have a simple rule of hiring. Um, and our rule of hiring is never hire someone unless they will raise the average for that position. And you know, most of you are in growing businesses and you're hiring people. And it's really easy. You, know, you start out with a company of really great people. Uh, busting their ass, passionate, committed, and let's say they're, you know, on a scale of one to ten, uh, you start out and you got a couple of people that are nines and tens, and maybe eights. And as you start to hire, you'll hire, you know, you'll hire some sixes, sevens, and eights, and uh, and then those people will hire some, you know, fives and sixes, and maybe an occasional four when you do the kind of desperation hiring where you need somebody to fill a position, you hire the best candidate that you have. Um, we do it differently. We don't hire somebody unless we believe they are better than the average person we have doing that job. And that has kept us from, you know, slumping into uh, average. Uh, because eventually, if you don't raise the average, you end up with all average people. Um, some better, some worse, but on average, you're average. That's just the way the law of numbers works. And I think all of us would agree that average sucks. You know, none of us got into this to be average. None of us got into it to work with average people in an average company. That's the cubicle that Eric was talking about. Um, and unless you pay a lot of attention to the quality of the people that you bring in to your companies, um, you are going to inevitably to slump toward average. The uh, next couple of things I wrote, um, you know, like all of you, you know, I'm sort of uh, doing everything still at my company, and there's lots of, you know, you get pulled in lots of different ways. Um, what I learned is every day I get up uh, and I think about what are the two or three things I need to do that day uh, to have a successful day? And then I make sure I do those. But all of you, as your businesses grow, will get pulled in many different directions. And I guess uh, for me, I learned at the very beginning to focus on two things. And I used to tell Rhonda, uh, Rhonda, there's only two things we need to do to be successful. We need to make great beer every time 
give it to people fresh, and we need to work our asses off to sell it. And if we do those two things, if we make and deliver to the drinker great beer and work our asses off to sell it, we'll be okay. And we work. Um, and that leads to the next point, which is selling. Um, I had to learn to sell when I started this. I never sold anything in my life. I, I mean, I didn't even think that selling was a dignified activity. You know, I thought it was kind of sleazy. You know, you go to high school, you have to read Death of a Salesman. I mean, nobody aspires to be Willy Loman. You know, you see the Wolf of Wall Street, the guy, you know, might aspire to be him. Um, but he did end up in prison, so maybe it wasn't such a good thing. Uh, people don't aspire to be salesmen, but uh, if done right, it's a truly dignified activity because uh, to me, what selling is all about is uh, finding a way to help your customer improve their business and accomplish their objectives. And you know, I've been working with Kroger for 20 years, trying to get them to sell more craft beer, and it worked. And uh, not only do they have you know nice uh, big uh, displays and shelves of craft beer that they didn't used to have, but I feel great about selling that to them because they make a lot more money than they made out of all those damn suitcases of Bud Light. So I think I did them a favor. You know, when I first started calling on them 20 years ago, telling them they needed to you know wake up and start selling good beer, and it worked out. The last couple of things: uh, the string theory. This is not like astrophysics. Um, my string theory is very simple, uh, and I learned it. Uh, when uh, I, I used to be an outward bound instructor back in the 70s. Um, there's an outward bound where you take this group of people, um, basically back then they're mostly like 20 something. You're out in the woods for 28 days, you're very self sufficient. Um, and one of the things I learned is, you know, when I supplied my, my group, um, you give them you know, a bunch of different things, obviously, packs and food bags and tarps and stoves and so forth. Uh, but they also got this string, it was called Alpine cord, but it was basically string, and you used it to, you know, uh, put up your tarps or your tents, depending on the course, and tie things to your pack and so forth. And I discovered if I gave people plenty of string, uh, by the end of the 28 days, they didn't have enough. Because they would have cut it up, in, to too many small pieces, they left pieces of it tied on the trees, they never really learned to use it efficiently because they had plenty. So by the end of the course, they didn't have enough. So I it did something totally different. Um, when they started, I didn't give them enough. I gave them like half of what I gave them, what you were supposed to give them. And by the end of the course, they had plenty because they learned to use it efficiently um, they would get the little bits that were left on the trees and the bushes from the other patrol um, and tie them together. And at the end of the course, they had plenty. And the lesson I got out of that in, in business is that um, I mean, we're all small businesses. And, and as the big brewers come in, um, they are going to try to put us all out of business. Um, they want the share market that we have. Nothing, evil about that. That's what they're supposed to do. They're in business. They're supposed to make and sell as much beer as they profitably can. They want what we have, what we have created. As my friend uh, Sam Calgioni from Dogfish said, says they want our mojo. And they do. And we're increasingly going to see them coming into our space and our tap handles. Uh, and what I learned um, is in business, Culture and values can often substitute for money and resources. And we will never match the big guys in their money and resources, but we can win and have won for uh, over 30 years now with superior culture and values. More passion for the business, um, I think more concern for our communities, and just uh, businesses where uh, you can't afford to waste anything, where you've got to save all the little bits of string, uh, where you can't be inefficient or sloppy or wasteful. So 
uh, running well-run, efficient, lean companies where you spend your resources on the need to have and forget about the nice to have is a survival skill. In the Boston Beer Company, we didn't have an office for uh, over a year. We didn't have a telephone for over a year. Ron and I had car phones back when, you know, they were just the size of a rollerboard that went to your trunk. We each had a car phone, but we had to, but it cost 40 cents a minute to make those phone calls. So if we had to make phone calls, we knew where all the good pay phones were in Boston, the ones that were warm in the winter, or the ones that didn't have a lot of people around them. So, you know, we just put dimes in those pay phones. That's how we made our phone calls. And uh, we had an answering service, which is a bunch of old ladies that sat in the basement in the back bay. And uh, they, we did have a phone number. They answered that phone number. And then we'd call in and get our messages from the old ladies. That was